Welcome to our Friday afternoon seminar. Uh, so this Friday we have Dr. Steve Hamilton, who's uh, an ecosystem scientist and biogeochemist by training, and he's currently a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at Michigan State University. And so since 1995, I almost said 75, but 95, uh, he's been at the WK Kellogg Biological Station, which is near Kalamazoo, Michigan, and he's currently the associate director there. Uh, so his research interests span many disciplines, so from how, from how nitrogen is transformed in aquatic ecosystems to the ramifications of hydropower on watersheds, and today he was telling us about his research uh, in South America on that particular topic. Uh, so at KBS, so the Kellogg Biological Station, he serves as the, prince, or the lead PI of the NSF-funded long-term ecological research site that's focused on agroecosystems and agronomic crops that he'll talk about today. And he also leads the biogeochemical processes area in the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, which he will also talk about today. So that's funded by the Department of Energy. And so along with members of his lab, he's done diverse things like characterize the impact of an oil spill on the Kalamazoo River. And more recently, also he told us about this today, how hippos can influence biogeochemical cycling in water holes in Kenya. And I don't know if you're gonna talk about that today. Nope. But it was a really interesting story. <laughs> um, so please help me welcome Dr. Steve Hamilton. Thank you, Eric. You're all set here. Thanks for coming, and I've had fun talking to uh, to people. I know it's always hard to talk to a guest before you've heard the seminar, right? So I, I, I enjoyed it myself, and hope you did too. Uh, now, what I would do today, and Aaron's suggestion, is, and is to um, talk about our long-term multi-investigator collaborative agroecological research. We've got two big projects I'll describe a little bit in general, and then I'll, I'll give you some key results from one specific area of biogeochemical work that we've done. The projects are much broader than, than that. So, uh, Kellogg Biological Station is where I work, and it's approximately there in Michigan. This is an off-campus academic unit of MSU, Michigan State University. We call it a field station, but it's almost like a satellite campus. The mission of KBS is to increase our understanding of natural and managed ecosystems and their links to society. And we have um, at least a dozen resident faculty there at any one time that span the discipline of ecology. So we're not all agricultural at all, but a couple of us work primarily on agricultural topics. And the big long-term projects I'll talk about mostly today are the National Science Foundation, NSF-funded long-term ecological research site, and the Department of Energy-funded Bioenergy Research Center, we call the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. We're also a USDA long-term agroecological research site, but we're because we're not owned by USDA, we're in the category of some sites in that project that are I'm hoping to get funded someday, not yet funded. So a little bit about the National Science Foundation LPR program. This started getting set up back in 1980. KBS was actually chartered as a row crop agricultural site. It's the only one still in this network. There, the rest of them are located all around North America, uh, well, the US and uh, including Alaska, Antarctica, and there's one in, in Morea in the South Pacific that has coral reefs. And the idea is to not represent every biome, but to span a, a wide range of biomes, mostly unmanaged, some quite pristine sites, but also some managed sites. And there's some grazing land sites as well as row crop sites in the network. It's a six year funding cycle, and you need to write a competitive proposal every six years. Ours went in today um, to, um, to keep funded. And so it's not an entitlement for funding forever. When you get one of these things and so some sites have gone away uh, some early on in their history some after it's quite some time like 20 or 30 years 
but, but many of them have been in the program since its inception and generating truly uh, long-term data. And what we're directed to do, because it's National Science Foundation, we conduct fundamental research to understand the ecology of these, these model ecosystems, we can call it. And the LTR network, the sites are directed to, from the start, has been this way to work, cover certain core areas of ecosystem science. And these were written in 1980, and they seem perhaps, to, I, I would love to rewrite them, let's put it that way. Uh, but we stuck to them. Um, so we work on primary production, uh, populations of organisms, organic matter, inorganic nutrients, and disturbance. And of course, we do a lot of, in the global change area of disturbance these days. And the idea of this, why, why, you might wonder why, why fund this? Why not put the money into short-term grants, three to five-year grants, and, which is what the National Science Foundation usually does. But it was recognized that for ecosystem research, there were some things that can only be studied over the long term with consistent, sustained observations and, and experiments. And so for example, slow processes, a lot of you are familiar with soil carbon. Soil carbon is extremely spatially variable. If you have a land cover change or a crop management change, soil carbon may respond, but it's not uncommon. You need about 10 years to even be able to measure that change against the background of spatial variability. And with the normal funding system, it's pretty hard to get funding to, to do something like that, to, to you know, look at decadal scale soil carbon changes. Whereas we've been able to do that with the LTER. So we've gone back and, and followed the same site with the same experimental treatments for 30 years in our case. Also, over time, you get occasional episodic or really rare and frequent events. We've had hurricanes completely devastate an LTR site. We've had you know, record droughts. We've had uh, forest fires, things like that come in. And being able to have a long baseline of data before such an event and then follow the response during and after the event has proven really interesting. Also, just to establish that there is a long-term trend, that things are changing in time, often requires this kind of sustained observation of the program. And sometimes there's big time lags too that can only be seen um, with the long-term monitoring. So we're required in, in our work to capitalize on long-term data observations and experiments. For example, in the renewal proposal we just submitted in the results of prior research, it was all about what have we learned from all of our 30 years of measurements and how does that inform our next phase of research. Right? We can do some other things. We can go off and conduct some new experiment that might only last for three years or whatever, but the foundation of the work has to be based on this long-term research. Otherwise, NSF could say, you should just be funded by a normal program. Just go out there and they'll submit to those other <coughs> programs. So KBS LCR was founded by Phil Robertson, who's still involved with it. And he was a postdoc at the time when they wrote the proposal, and, and their original question is one that we, we still pursue, really. And this is it, you know, how can we manage agricultural systems with biology rather than chemistry? Now that's a, a more popular topic now than it was in 1988, but we still are working on it. We still haven't, you know, cracked it well enough. Um, the idea, of course, is, you know, how, how can we maintain high yields but improve the environmental performance of our, our cropping system? without you know, more, more chemicals and, and more disturbance. These are some of the topics. You can read them faster than I can say them, but we've been these major lines of research. And the project was, was more specifically agronomic in the early days, and then it's grown and diversified over time and gotten quite a bit more complex as well, and including social science, human dimensions, research. Um, the, these major lines of research were in the early part of the project pursued more or less independently. We, we all looked at the same experiment if we needed a field of experiment, but, but we didn't we weren't as integrated as we are now. And that's another bar that NSF keeps raising. They, they, they want us to become more and more um, integrative so that, that every part of the project, every major part is, is part of a, a larger whole, which is you know challenging as you can imagine. Uh, if you're working on soil microbiology and, and farmer decision making, and you know, how do you integrate those things? We set up this experiment, and this is a little different than a typical agricultural experiment for a couple of reasons. First, corn and soybean are the main crops in our region, and we are we like to think that we represent the whole north central region. It's imperfect that way because it's only one site, but 
we grow corn soybean, we add wheat to the rotation in order to be able to, to have an organic treatment where nitrogen fixing legume cover crops provided the nitrogen. So we have conventional tillage, does business as usual, at least the way it used to be. We have no till with full chemical inputs. We have low input where we add one third the fertilizer with legume cover. And then the organic, sometimes we call it biologically based with legume cover, but no manure or anything like that. So we have that comparison. Then we also have, we've had alfalfa. We're thinking about switching to the switchgrass in our alfalfa treatments because it hasn't been utilized scientifically that much. We have hybrid poplars. In 1988, they were talking about that for bioelectricity, combusting, you know, woody biomass to make electricity. Then that idea went away. And then no one was interested in poplars. And then a few years ago, there was, was Resurgence of interest in making ethanol out of poplars. So our poplars are popular again, <laughs> uh, but they're hard to, to grow continuously. We've been working on that. And then the other unusual thing about this is we also study unmanaged communities in the same vicinity on the same soil. Basically, all the the entire place was, of course, deforested by the original settlers and they attempted agriculture. But then we've got forests that are as old as 80 or 90 years and, and one really old growth one. And then fields in various stages of succession back to forest. And we make the same measurements on those places. The main cropping system experiment, but not, not including the, the forest and, and old fields, is a randomized lot design. We have big plots, one hectare size plots, because if you're going to keep sampling year after year after year, you can't have a really small plot, or pretty soon all the soil will be in jars and <laughs> more than any soil left, right? So we have these one hectare plots and we, we very carefully track the sampling so that we don't sample the same soil place twice, right? And uh, it also has room for micro plots for various kinds of experiments on the north end of these. If, if we can, if for graduate students and all that, did conduct manipulations. Other than the large plot size, there's nothing too unusual there. <clears throat> And then the unmanaged sites, they're distributed on the property. So that what we just looked at is up in the upper right there, the LTER main site. And then we have these, these wood lots and fields, which were more like fields in 1988, and they're getting more like forests all the time. So they're undergoing natural succession back to the forests that originally covered much of this area. And, and so we can look at the things like accumulation of soil organic carbon and changes in soil microbial communities and so on as we accompany that process over the years. We're also <coughs> encouraged, if not required, to have a conceptual framework in our proposals. This is the current one that, that we have a new one though that I'll show you in a minute. Um, these are fairly simple, but they, they attempt to encapsulate everything that we do. And we use them a lot for public presentations and so on. But suffice to say that they, they also have gotten, uh, even though it's simple, it's a lot more complicated than our early ones were. Because as a project has diversified and, and gotten more complex, especially with the human dimensions and, and trying to get the whole feedback back around, you know, um, we've gotten we've had to make these more more um, integrative, you could say. So drivers of change, you know, we're very interested in climate change. We've done some work on invasive species, and of course the, the role of crop management decisions in affecting the the you know, sustainability and ecosystem services being the, the ultimate, you know, um, phenomenon of interest in the case of agricultural landscapes. And we're trying to think of more and more on the landscape scale as well. This is our new conceptual model. I don't know if you can see it too well or not, this little paint on the screen there. But we're, we're going to try to better understand resilience. The resilience, of course, is it's like kind of a buzzword that everyone's talking about nowadays, but we're well poised to, to look at the mechanisms of resilience. So that's what would be distinctive here. Because we've got all this information looking at these systems for 30 years, and we've had various kinds of perturbations, plus long-term trends like warming and more extreme rainfalls and things like that. And so based on that, we, we think we can try to understand you know, resilience in terms of the resistance to change in the face of a disturbance, and then how fast things recover after a disturbance. And We'll be looking more at, at conservation and semi natural lands, we call it there, in addition to annual crops and perennial kind of monoculture crops in the future. And as a model of disturbance, we're going to simulate growing season droughts. So we're going to build 
a very large number of these kinds of rain off shelters, which have been deployed a lot in agricultural and grassland systems. We will divert, say, 60% of the rainfall to produce a, a growing season drought of, of maybe five weeks duration, something like that, and probably in the uh, July, August time frame. And that would be the disturbance. Now, within there, this is going to even be even bigger than this one. And we'll have 45 of these things, so it's going to be a lot of work to set up and take out every time you need to go in the field. But, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll have some that we produce a single severe drought and then monitor it over time. And we'll have some where we have a series of, of sequence, if you will, of, of droughts year after year. And we're going to add soil organic carbon, biochar is the plan, in the one quarter of the area and add um, bioinoculants, microbes to be determined all uh, the details in another part. And, and we'll be studying you know, the, the, um, the, the reference system will be the normal rainfall outside of these. But we're going to get into this stuff big time. We've played around with it a little bit in the last few years and have a pretty good idea of what's feasible and we think we can pull it off with the staff that we have, we hope. <laughs> OK. But the other big project I want to describe a little bit is the, the bioenergy research. And this is, is newer. It started in 2007. The Department of Energy funded a couple of these bioenergy research centers. And we're the only one that's not a, associated with a national lab. And we got this funding together with the University of Wisconsin for the past 10 years. It's been a roughly equal partnership. And this, I say phase one because we just started phase two, so we got another five years of funding. And the mission of the first phase, the first 10 years, was to, to perform fundamental research aimed at removing bottlenecks in the lignocellulosic biomass and bioenergy pipeline. So we passed this act, Energy Independence and Security Act, that mandated government subsidies and incentives to produce biofuels. And we're exceedingly successful at starting up a corn grain ethanol industry right so now a major part of our corn harvest goes to make ethanol we've got fire refineries and all that uh, as you well know i'm sure but our research was never about that we already knew how to make ethanol from corn grain at the outset of this research we're working on, on taking whole plants and making them into ethanol that was the idea hence the legal study elastic up there so we're talking about harvesting perennial plant Crops could be dedicated crops, could be um, thinning from forestry, uh, could be uh, uh, corn silver, actually, uh, it's another potential source. And so we worked on this for about 10 years. And this is a massive project, a sustainability part that Bill Robertson and I ran was a, you know, I don't know, a quarter or something of the whole project or less. So, so there are lots of people I never even met that work on this project, and chemical engineers. And, plant breeders and geneticists and so on, working on all the steps of you know, the process, but it's over here, growing the plants sustainably is our, our department, right? And the idea of sustainability is broadly defined, so of course you need economic sustainability, it's gotta be profitable, so farmers would grow it. Um, and then we were, were seeking systems that, that would help to, to mitigate climate change. <coughs> Carbon negative is, would be ideal, it would actually take up, and be net carbon sinks, take up CO2 from the atmosphere, but at least not be a net source of CO2 to the atmosphere, right? Uh, we want, want to be maximum nutrient conservation. We don't want to have to fertilize bioenergy crops very much, if at all, because it you know, makes it, you know, it alters the economic equation and reduces all the other problems that, frankly, corn, grain, ethanol is producing, right? nitrogen escape into the environment, groundwater, nitrous oxide emission, things like that. And then we're very interested in potential biodiversity benefits with the diversification of agricultural landscapes. So even putting grass monocultures in amongst um, uh, annual grain crops is one form of diversification. But better yet, could we grow restored prairies and harvest them, or polycultures of a few species at least that would bring biodiversity benefits. So we're very interested in that. And then, of course, the social, socio ecological, or socioeconomic benefits. So, we had people working on all this, these aspects. This was our roadmap. You know, talking in the past, even though we're still publishing all this because we're entering a new phase with a somewhat different emphasis. But, but um, this is for the sustainability part, the part that Phil Robertson and I and 
and a team of other people work on. And so we had projects and all these things. I was leading biochemical services, as Aaron mentioned. And so the um, importantly, all this feeds into modeling and life cycle analysis and scenarios and and also the in, should inform policy. That's the idea. Now, what's happened over the last 10, 11 years is the um, the fire price of petroleum dropped, production increased greatly. Our country, you know, produces a lot more of the petroleum we use. And I think at the outset we imported about half, and now we import a third or less. And and, and so the, the enthusiasm at the you know federal government level for pursuing ethanol, you know, decreased significantly. You might say because as long as fossil fuels are so cheap, then it, you know we didn't have that that need so much anymore. Now the Department of Energy takes the long view though, and they they, they figure it's not always going to be that way and, and they should be investing in research to build up this capacity anyway so that they, they continue to, to fund some of this work. What we did in the field was after our experience with LTER, we, we were, knew how to, to set these experiments up. So we set up a similar experiment, not quite such large plots. I think they're 30 by 40 meters and we, we have this gradient of, of Perspective cellulosic biofuel crops that are appropriate for our region, things like switchgrass, miscanthus, poplar, woody crop, some polycultures, and, and restored native prairie. That's in the far end of the diversity gradient. And then we have continuous corn and corn soybean rotation for reference because that's that we compare everything against that. And, and so we set this experiment up in 2007 and we, it's still there today. We studied it intensely. We're going to back up a bit on that in the next phase um, and focus <coughs> on particular switchgrass and, and poplar and whatever native vegetation is present. We're going to explain that in a second. That, by the way, is Ms. Campus being harvested in the upper right. So if you had some here, I think, as part of the EBI project in Illinois. Here's an aerial view of that. Sorry, so our biological station is on that lake back there. And this was, these are two 40 acre parcels that were in um, row crop agriculture for many years. Kind of similar. Um, you can see there's room for, for smaller experiments. If I can get some work down there. And, and oh, that is interesting. Okay, over there. <laughs> I like this pointer that we used it though. Okay, so that, now we've been. Funded for another five years. Now there's there's another bioenergy research center. So the University of Illinois, it had the Energy Biosciences Institute, funded by Monsanto, um, is now a, a, a DOE bioenergy research center. And so and we're being encouraged to work together more on, on these problems. And, and instead of ethanol, the call for proposals that we should think more about specialty bioproducts and specialty biofuels. So on the far right there. So there's a lot of interest. They figure we've learned enough about ethanol, as I said, for the time being. There's a lot of interest in whether we could make other kinds of chemicals that would displace petrochemical feedstocks, uh, things like isobutanol, for example. And so that's a, requires a new team on that end of the work, or a new focus at least, right? And, and so it's got people doing that. But we're still in the business of trying to figure out how to sustainably grow biomass on our end. <laughs> so we're, we're still. So the sustainable part, we're working on the left of this diagram, and, and this new emphasis doesn't really change our work that much, except that because of the there, there's a debate that started almost as soon as grain, corn grain ethanol was was started to be developed in the U.S. and it, is, it goes like this: if we're going to be producing ethanol and land that could be used to grow food, then somewhere else somebody's got to grow the food. It's called the food versus fuel debate. Right, and the the idea that you might be able to uh, grow cellulosic biofuel crops on former corn fields, say, is going to cause somebody to grow corn or soybeans somewhere else. Now it might be Brazil, and they might be deforesting rainforests or con converting Christine savanna to um, soybeans, right, or something like that. And if so, then you have this thing called indirect land use change, where you, by your policies inside the U.S. and through the global commodities trading, you're causing conversion of, of ecosystems and net carbon loss to the atmosphere. And, and you could be doing more harm than good. I mean, you would be if it was a 
if it really works exactly that way, you can easily show that if you know your carbon gains by putting in perennial crops and displacing gasoline use here in the US would be easily um, outdone by carbon losses to the atmosphere and if they're converting pristine ecosystems. So we're all about marginal lands now. So we're looking for crops that can be grown on land that is unsuitable for food crops. And, and so that's, that's another um, focus or constraint that we operate under now. So the KBS experiment is actually, it's not prime farmland by any measure, but it, it's, it's arable land. And, and so we, uh, now we're expanding to this network of marginal land sites and the, um, the crops we're going to focus on are up there. I don't think you say that that well, but switchgrass, mixtures of grasses, poplar, and energy sorghum. And we're, we're focused on these research areas here soil carbon, nitrogen fixation, not symbiotic, but associated nitrogen fixation, which might be important. Nitrous oxide, how it gets produced and emitted to the atmosphere, being a greenhouse gas. Albedo, the net radiation balance of the different land covers and water use. So that's our new focus starting this growing season coming up. So I thought I'd spend a little time giving you some, talking about some example of, of one line of research and that's ecosystem services and agricultural landscapes and, and kind of emphasize the biogeochemical part which is what I'm more comfortable with, um, but recognize that, that there's a lot of more that goes on with these projects than what I'll, I'll talk about here. First of all, yield. So we have that cropping system experiment that has conventional and then these three treatments that I was mentioning. And you can express yield relative to conventional. So conventional being one, everything else divided by that, right, by conventional. So if it's better than conventional, it's above the one line, the dash line. If it's worse than conventional, it's below. And you see that um, no-till actually performs as well, if not better, than conventional for these corn, soybean, and wheat crops. Reduced input does pretty well, except for wheat. I think wheat is a little bit nitrogen uh, stress. The biologically based or organic treatment, soybeans are okay because they can make their own nitrogen, but the other crops are suffering, so they're just not as good, right? Perhaps no surprise there, but there's a lot of data in here, 1989 to 2015. And with rotations, you know, it takes a while to get a bunch of replicate corn years or soybean years, right? So we have a lot of uh, confidence in, in what we're seeing here. We, um, I'm talking about episodic events. The 2012 drought year, which you probably experienced here as well, was, was quite severe in terms of its effects on, on crop yield, right? And the 2012 happened to be a soybean year for us, so that's what we had on the field. You can see that the yields here, we noticed that the no-till did quite a lot better than the other treatments in 2012. And so when we were exploring why we, we got these soil water content data together, and we found that uh, this shows us no-till versus conventional, no-till being the open circles there, right? No-till soils were holding a lot more water at the start of the drought. And that was a, a, a couple of inches of water that really benefited, really helped get the crop through that drought period. And why is that? It's quite likely because the no-till soils have accumulated soil organic matter compared to conventional in our experiment. So we already documented that. So we think it's a fairly straightforward matter, we think, of uh, greater soil water holding capacity. And we've got sandy loams here, so you know, their water holding capacity is limited. And, and so the buildup of organic matter over the last couple of decades has allowed these Soils that hold more water against gravity, and then that gives the crop a head start. If it starts to run out of water, it can, it can draw on that soil water resource. We've worked a lot on nitrate leaching. I know you do some of this work here too. Um, methods are important here because there aren't any good ones. <laughs> but um, what we do in our, what works in our system doesn't work in, in other soils sometimes, but we use these tension lysimeters, so porous cup soil water samplers that you bury down below the root zone and you draw a vacuum on the system and suck up the water for about 24 hours. You can get a water sample if there's reasonably good soil water content that way. And then we do modeling to figure out when the water's on the move. And with the occasional concentration measurements and then the modeling, we put together nitrate leaching rates. And this actually shows the 
the nitrogen, the average annual loss over 11 years measured this way. And what you see is, is pretty, um, it concords with theory pretty well, you can say. Um, the conventional loses the most. So you're, we're fertilizing at a high rate and, and it's tilled and, and disturbed. Um, No-till loses somewhat less. Reduced input gets less fertilizer, so it uses less. Biologically, they still leaches nitrate because you've got nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixing crops going on there, right? Alfalfa, also a nitrogen fixer. Poplar does not let any nitrogen escape. I mean, that's like a gauntlet that no nitrogen atom has ever gotten through, apparently. Um, <laughs> if you dig there, you find a pure root mat underneath the poplar, but it's kind of not surprising. Now, in ecosystem analysis, when we look at it, like watershed nitrogen budgets, actually any element that's needed by plants, we find that ecosystems that are rapidly growing and creating biomass tend to retain nitrogen, and the poplars are rapidly growing, then we cut them and they regrow again. So that's not surprising. The successional forests also seem to retain nitrogen very well. The mature deciduous forests seem to be approaching more of a steady state where it was releasing nitrogen more or less in proportion perhaps to the, the atmospheric deposition over this time period. It's a little higher than atmospheric deposition though. But there, must, there could be some fixation going on there. But there's also big error bar there. So, but anyway, those, those kinds of results made sense to us. Um, now we're, we're doing a lot of that with perennial crops with the bioenergy cropping system work. And not surprisingly, they don't let much nitrogen out either because their root systems are there all year round. And, as soon as it warms up, they're you know potentially active. All right, I want to talk about uh, greenhouse gases a little bit because that's been a major focus. I think our site's especially known for the work on nitrous oxide. Bill Robertson's lab has done a lot of work on that. Uh, but agriculture actually is involved in these these increases. This is the year one thousand to the year two thousand, right? The constructed increases. Agriculture's uh, involved in all of these carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And of course, you probably know nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, 296 times more radiative forcing per molecule than carbon dioxide. So a little nitrous oxide goes a long way in terms, in terms of climate change. Okay. And if you want to understand the global warming impact of an agricultural activity, it, you have to account for a lot of things and, and it depends on where you draw your boundaries as well. But these are all the, the in-field things that we account for to try to evaluate global carbon or global warming impact. Global warming impact being the, whether it's a net warming or net cooling effect on the climate, right? So soil carbon change, because if you lose carbon, that's still through the atmosphere. If you gain carbon, that's still out of the atmosphere, right? Fuel use, if you're burning fuel to till, for example, you know, that has to be accounted for. Nitrogen fertilizer, it's, cost, it's costing terms of energy to make nitrogen fertilizer. And so that's actually a significant part of the equation. Um, lime inputs, you know, lime has to be, nowadays it's mined and quarried someplace far away and ground up and transported on trucks and spread on the field. That's all, all entails energy use, right? And then what's the fate of the carbon in the lime? That's a, a particular topic I worked on. It's kind of interesting, actually. Not, not all becomes steel too. Other inputs, pesticides, seeds, you know, um, nitrous oxide emission to what fraction of the, the nitrogen it escapes as nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. And then methane, air, upland soils generally consume methane by methanotrophic bacteria. And it's a really low rate, it's actually hard to measure. So if you put chambers down over the soils, half the time you can't detect the change, and half the time you detect some uptake. But there's so much agricultural soil in the world that it's important. And, and it turns out that. Uh, Fertilized soils consume less methane per square meter than, than natural ecosystems do. So that's a, that affects the global methane balance. In terms of soil carbon, we were talking about this a bit this morning, but you know, it's always it's in the textbooks, it's always been the dogma that, that the original soil organic carbon levels were higher before settlement whether it was uh, grassland like prairie or forest. And then when we converted it to agriculture, they fell on the trajectory not unlike the upper right there over some decades. It would eventually level out at some lower level, which is often roughly about half of where it started. And so that the conversion of vast amounts of land from natural forest or grassland to agriculture 
it adds up to a lot of CO2 that went into the atmosphere from this, this land use change, right? And so this this is a, a topic of interest now because if maybe we could manage things differently, like use no-till and bring some of this carbon back, at least for they'll accumulate for a time until they reach a new equilibrium. Um, globally, really back the envelope calculations that estimate you know 54 petagrams of carbon lost out of the original 222 petagrams. So about a quarter of the global soil organic carbon in stock has gone into the atmosphere due to land use conversion. How could you restore soil carbon? You know, there's agricultural management could potentially do this, and a lot of you are very familiar with this topic. Um, you could use cover crops that might increase inputs either through roots or litter. Um, certain kinds of rotations can increase carbon inputs, um, leaving more residue on the field. Can, can increase carbon inputs. And you can do some things to try to, to slow the decomposition of carbon in the soil. No till seems to, to help a lot, um, allowing soil aggregates to form and, and you can get physically protected um, soil organic carbon inside aggregates, things like that. And so it's thought that we could recover, in the beginning at least, 0.3 to 0.5 petagrams of carbon per year. Now that's going to Going to be the mirror image of that drop, and eventually it's probably going to you know level up steady to a steady state. But that might be 50 years from now. We don't, we, we wish we knew, but we don't really know the time course to take. Nitrous oxide, um, that nitrous oxide, you know, time course that we showed that jumping up exponentially in recent years is mostly due to agriculture. There's some industrial sources, but you see here. Soil emissions, that would be especially from denitrification, also nitrification. Um, you can't assume. So the biomass burning is small and cattle and feedlots in particular. Uh, um, I think that we should mention uh, the right, sorry, um, that's a little leave like that. <laughs> About 80% of the info comes from agriculture. So agriculture has big mitigation potential. That's, you've probably heard a lot of. This shows uh, the averages from long-term measurements of nitrous oxide emission. Nitrous oxide is hard to work with. It's really spatially and temporally variable, finicky in the lab, um, but we, we think we've got it down pretty well. And now I like the nitrate leaching. You know, you kind of see the expected pattern. The fertilized systems produce the most nitrous oxide or, or field nitrogen fixing crops. Uh, Poplar does release nitrous oxide, even though it doesn't let any nitrate leach, and then the the successional ecosystems produce less, but there is still some nitrous oxide emission in the absence of fertilization. So I think this is one of the best characterized sites in terms of nitrous oxides um, and nitrogen transformations in general due to, to the long-term funding from the LPEF. We've been very interested in this phenomenon of over-fertilization and what that means for nitrous oxide emission and nitrate leaching for that matter. So this graph actually, we set up a, an experiment where we added nitrogen at different levels from really low to really high. And so you've got zero, and then the red numbers show the, the nitrogen addition rates. And as you might expect, and someone was showing me data um, today from another site, yield levels off at, at a certain you know, you reach a point where the crop needs are met, and then you don't get a yield response above that. But what we find is that nitrous oxide emission and nitrate leaching actually increase exponentially above that point. And so to the extent that we're adding more fertilizer beyond that, that, that optimum fertilization rate, then we're, we're creating a lot of N2O emission. And then to the extent that nitrate's leaching more, besides the water quality problems that nitrate is associated with, there's a lot of downstream denitrification that happens that nitrate gets into wetlands and streams and floodplains and rivers, there's more denitrification on downstream, right? So there's a lot of potential for mitigation of this if we could fertilize at the optimum rate. If we knew that for particular settings and, and with precision agriculture, we can even do it, you know, sub field levels fertilize at the optimum rate. That would be more troublesome and costly, but it might be worth society's um, investment in incentivizing farmers to do that kind of thing as a climate change mitigation practice, right? Okay, so kind of summarizing all that work I just talked about, 
and more. Um, we can look at the global warming impact by category here. In our conventional treatment, you see that uh, soil carbon is not changing because it, it, they've been farmed that way for, they've been in row crops for 150 years. And you see the other terms there, nitrous oxide is a, the single largest source of global warming potential. And the net is a positive number, meaning net global warming, net climate warming of 101 there. Now, uh, compared to no-till, no-till, at least so far, is accumulating soil carbon. And so that brings a negative number to the soil carbon category. More or less the same um, nitrogen fertilization, less fuel use, um, N2O is pretty similar, but the balance is a, a, a negative number. Yeah. So it actually has a, apparently, a net cooling effect on climate. This is the corn soybean wheat rotation, remember. Biologically based or organic system is accumulating even more soil carbon, so a higher negative number there. Um, the net is even more negative. So that's, that's even better, but you've got the yield problem. To produce the same amount of food, you're gonna to have to put more land into production, at, and then, then you know, the, yeah, there's issues associated with that, where you find it and so on. And then the successional ecosystems, the ones that are actually under succession, growing, you know, biomass every year, getting more, more plant biomass accumulated, primarily woody, they have large negative terms. So they're really successional. Sorry, your early successional is herbaceous. So that's actually building soil organic carbon. The mid-successional is slowed down in soil organic carbon buildup, but it's building woody biomass. And then this deciduous forest is apparently is an equilibrium. And, and so you see the successional ecosystems on former farmland, it's important detail, um, actually have large negative uh, emissions, called negative emissions sometimes. Net carbon up, net uh, greenhouse gas update. Okay. All of this is applies to the first two decades of these land use land management changes, and and that's. But you know, if we could, um, if we could buy 20, 30, 40 years to reduce climate change, while we figure other ways to deal with this problem, that would, you know, it's still valuable. So to, to say that this is only going to work for for up to 50 years is not a reason not to do it, I, I suggest. Not to think about it, at least. <clears throat> Putting all together in graphical form, Phil Robertson published something like this in 2000, but this is updated. So GWI, <clears throat> global warming impact, positive values, net warming, negative net cooling. And, and you can see those, those are the same numbers in the far right that we just looked at. We can think about biofuel crops, because those are food crops, right? And what if we actually use the crops for biofuel? And in this case, we can express everything in CO2 equivalents from the, we use our LTR data, and we're using corn and soybean grain for biofuel as well as the cellulosic part. So it's grain and cellulosic biofuel combined. And there's a legend here to decode it, but it's the same order I've been presenting it. And Without indirect land use change um, considerations, then all of these biofuel production systems have a net negative global warming impact. In other words, they're, they're beneficial for the climate. Now, if though somebody needs to convert some land somewhere else, some pristine land especially, to grow the food that's no longer being grown on this land, that's a problem, right? And it's gonna depend on exactly where that's happening and what the land use history of that land is, right, in context. We can look at just cellulosic crops using our, you know, the, the 11 years of data, 10 years of data that we have on the global the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. Um, and here we can actually add a new twist to the calculation because to the extent that we're making ethanol from biomass, we're not using fossil fuel to make gas, we're not using petroleum. So we can calculate a fossil fuel offset based on the energy value of the ethanol. If that's used to power cars and trucks and so on, transportation, then that we got the gasoline that was not used, and that gasoline had it been used would have been fossil CO2 going to the atmosphere. Whereas this CO2 that was taken out from you know some prior growing season more recently, much more recently. So in this case the um, 
we're making cellulosic ethanol, we're not using the grain, but we are using corn stover. And you can see how things stack up here. The fossil fuel offset is the, the light blue there, and that becomes a big part of the equation for the net overwarming impact. And you can get with a highly productive biomass crop like Ms. Campus. Switchgrass can almost be as productive, but we have problems harvesting it because of lodging and so on. Um, this campus is easier to harvest. You can get large net negative global warming impacts based on these calculations. This isn't the full picture because then you got to transport this stuff to some processing center and ultimately to a biorefinery. And so, properly, you should incorporate all that into your calculations, right? But every time you do a sort of a life cycle analysis like this, you got to draw boundaries. And our boundaries. Um, you know, don't, don't consider that processing part of the picture. Is this a good idea? I'm not going to suggest that it is. Uh, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's interesting and important research, but I, I don't think this is alone is enough evidence to go full speed ahead on this, you know, this path. <laughs> I mentioned that we want to focus on marginal bands to, to avoid this food versus fuel competition. And, and so we did a study of the marginal land availability in the upper Midwest with modeling and, and land cover data and trying to figure out where you could have a, a biorefinery. That's what the circles are in the bottom there. But we, we found enough locations to, to you know, produce about a quarter of the, the mandated production of the Energy Independence Security Act. That's what EISA is. And that's, there's a lot more potential marginal land in the Great Plains and, and Western U.S. Now, this, this avoids sensitive lands. And we're talking about land that could potentially be cultivated with mechanized harvesting equipment and so on, right? So we're not talking about going into, you know, Yosemite National Park or something like that and cutting down all the trees. Um, this potentially cultivatable land. Um, yeah, that's all I need to say about that, I think. So these are the kind of ecosystem services that, that we think can, can be enhanced in agricultural systems. We keep working on this, and this has been our goal all along. A lot of other people are working on this. Uh, obviously, we want to maintain yield and profitability. We want to maintain or improve water quality. We don't want to have our soil degrade in fertility. Um, the greenhouse gas thing is the most complex part of it, but we're learning more and more about that. Um, and then biodiversity benefits include these things. We've worked uh, at the landscape level, we can actually have beneficial arthropods, insects, and, and the like that, that can help suppress pests, right? It can work both ways, so sometimes some kinds of pests can be harbored in those places. So we need to keep working on that. Pollination, wildlife conservation, uh, it's recreational aesthetic values like you know, game bird hunting or or just bird watching and things like that are all possibilities. If we were, if we had more diverse agricultural landscapes, if, if we had more, if that's an extreme example of an experimental site, but if we had fewer areas with vast monocultures of the few grain crops and had more, you know, had some more mixtures, that's, that's kind of our, that's been our vision. You can put these ecosystem services into these spider plots, but I want to make sure I have time for questions, so I won't go into that in detail. Um, and finally, just a quick thing on the kind of human dimensions aspect. We work a lot on, on farmer decision making. We've also done valuation of ecosystem services from agriculture and considered ecosystem disservices as well. But this particular survey of, of Michigan farmers was asking them, are they willing to provide um, ecosystem services? Basically, what would it take to convince them to, to change their practices? Um, and obviously it would probably require financial incentives if it entails any cost or reduction in, in yield. But interestingly, they, they were, the, the negative values here are, are, are not really negative. They, it's more interest in this direction on this for these everything except the top one if, if they if they say it's important to them and then to society we've got global warming and they're very interested in improving their soil organic matter and that makes sense right because they, they understand that that's key to fertility soil conservation also nitrate leaching less phosphorus runoff less pesticide risk 
maybe we have less and less interest, but it's still there. And then global warming, there there is significant interest in among these farmers in in mitigating global warming, even though they might tell you they don't believe in it or something like that. So, so just a concluding slide here. There's there's certainly alternative ways that we can conduct agriculture that can better enhance a broad suite of ecosystem services. And we need to, to look for synergies and, and there's always going to be trade-offs. So we need to figure out you know how to optimize the option among the options. And it's all got to operate within the socio-ecological and psychological context, right? To, to, if we're going to convince policymakers to incentivize and farmers to to adopt these practices and take advantage of these standards. And, and a lot of this stuff we, we, we're learning how to do, we just we need to decide to do it, I think. Make up our mind and, and devote resources to it. Especially in the area of, of climate change, I, I think it's, it's high time that we almost take every measure we can to try to, to attack this problem. Okay, those are the acknowledgements. Okay, I guess we have time for a question too. Huh? Questions for Steve? So Steve, we spoke earlier today and you just alluded to it there at the end about the human dimension of all of this. So are there some rural sociologists or folks like that on board at uh, EDS and, and how well integrated are they in the hard times? There are a couple of, of different kinds of social scientists working on the project. Scott Swinton has been the longest continuous presence, and he's an agricultural economist. We have Sandy Mark Clark Payat, who works a lot on uh, farmer decision making, currently on the team as well. We have Diana Stewart, who's actually called herself a rural sociologist. She had to move to the West to be closer to her parents, but we lost her. Um, both Scott and Sandy will continue in the coming phase of, of LTEI. So we've got them on board. There's a lot of people at MSU that do this kind of stuff, you know, but we can't, because we're funded by the Division of Environmental Biology, we can't become a pri primarily social science project, right? The urban sites have learned that for the last review. They were kind of dinged for becoming too, too, too much social science now. That and the social science director doesn't pay into LPR, so there's this kind of political thing where you're funded by the Division of Environmental Biology, you're going to do primarily environmental biology or else. Right? So, so we can't, we have, it's always going to have to be a, a, a lesser part, like 20% or less of our effort, I think, even though two of our, our eight co PIs do that work. Yes. Maybe you said this. How is the how did you manage the no-till? I mean, with herbicide applications or and did that factor into all your calculations yeah. of effects and yeah, yeah, it does. And th this is another tricky thing about these long-term experiments is obviously crop varieties change and technological options change, right? So take Roundup Ready Soybean, for example. We didn't change over to that until like 80% of the farmers were doing it because Anytime we make a change like that, it complicates our long-term analysis, right? Um, so we didn't we didn't adopt GMO crops until, until we were sure everybody else was going to do it. If we didn't do it, we'd be seen as increasingly irrelevant, right? We're still growing the 1988 crop varieties and technology, so we got to change. But every time we change it, we wonder, you know, is this going to make it harder to compare the old data with the new? Right? Yeah. Yes. So I'm thinking to uh, your your ecosystem uh, ecosystem services floor table where you showed sort of the net outputs of global warming of the different uh, cropping systems. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, it looks like you were under fertilizing your biologic system or over fertilizing your conventional system. And so there's a big component there missing that you mentioned, but it's still not there, and that's the output of food products. That's the largest output of the annual crops, mm. and so I feel like you know what what would that look like if you fertilize to max yield to match yields from the biologically based systems, the conventional or at least the no-till system, or include that portion of lost yield because I, I think that really misrepresents the systems by not including that impact on the 
I know you got to draw boundaries, and I, and, I, and I appreciate your comment about boundaries, but at some point, if you draw your boundaries on the system too restrictively, you really start to misrepresent the system. Yeah, I understand your point. So how would we, if, if we're not going to add any fertilizers or bio, biological states, we don't know, add any chemicals, right? So we got to have some nitrogen fixation to do the job. When we're doing nitrogen fixing cover crops. How else could we match the nitrogen inputs without adding synthetic fertilizer? I mean, an organic farmer in Michigan would probably add manure, right? And that works great, but we made the decision at the outset of the project not to add manure for two reasons. One was that the red, there's not enough manure to add manure over the entire north central region, so it's not, not an option. You have to have animal agriculture facilities pretty nearby to have a source of manure, right? And the other reason is we're concerned about whether we'd be able to get a stable composition of manure year in, year out over the long term. Yeah, you can you can add manure and you can achieve much higher yields. I'm sure. That's, otherwise, I don't know how how we would do it with with strictly natural uh, nitrogen fixation. So, but what about cutting the rice in the conventional system or just quantifying mm -hmm. the impact of yield in that? Yeah. I mean, you've got three options basically yeah. to make a fair oh, comparison. Oh, we have that nitrogen gradient experiment, so we could we could try to look at the conventional you know yield. That have a nitrogen input similar to what we think the fixation gives here. We, we could do that with the data we have. We could look at that scenario. I don't, I'm not sure I'd say we over fertilize. Most of the local producers fertilize a lot more than we do. But we, we follow university guidelines and, and the uh, crop advisors tend to recommend higher rates in our area. And we did a study about where farmers are getting their advice from, and they're going way more to crop, um, to the fertilizer and seed companies than to university extension nowadays. And they're telling them to fertilize heavily. And yeah, in fact, we've got higher yielding varieties and denser planting and so on going on. So to, to some extent, they need more fertilizer. But we know exactly what the fertilizer response is for our crop, right? And we know we're not, I, I wouldn't say we're over fertilizing on average. Um, I'm not sure how you interpreted that here. Um, I mean, I guess you're always over fertilizing to some extent, I guess, if you've got nitrate leaching out the system, right? But the crop in our sandy loam soils with rapid um, infiltration and percolation rates, it's not uncommon that, that 25 to even 50 percent of the fertilizer is never harvested in the crop, right? It's lost to the environment. That's just a, that's a fact for the agriculture on those kinds of soils. Yeah. Well, in the biological system, then where's your phosphorus? We do have uh, potash for potassium, right? Phosphorus, we, we hardly ever need to add. Because the soils are pretty rich with the phosphorus, and because of historical conditions, perhaps they, they're well stocked with phosphorus. So we do test for it, and we do add it periodically. Um, and same, we test. We add only on a need, as needed basis, instead of year in and year out for those two. I was just going to make a comment um, in response to Josh's comment that you might, and you may have already done this, to look at it as like gram CO2 equivalent per unit yield <clears throat> to adjust for the fact that the yield is lower in the biologically base. Yeah, we have looked at that. Yeah. Um, what we call it? We had a name for it, but we, we have done those calculations. Yeah, I can't recall what it looks like, but uh, we have a we do have a publication that has that in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's another way to look at it. You know, there's, there's, it bears on this debate, this huge debate about land sharing versus land sparing and sustainable intensification and all that. So you're familiar with that, right? But maybe we'd be better off just hammering systems with all the fertilizer and irrigation and everything they could possibly want, growing, you know, the same amount of crops on a smaller area. Even though the per hectare, you know, greenhouse gas emissions would be much higher. If you've got less total land in there, that might be a better deal, right? And there's there's not a lot of consensus in the field about that, but it's interesting. Interesting.